Um, so as you might have gathered, this is sort of told, um, it's the story of a, a marketing person, and it's sort of also told in the stories of books like um, Sacred Cows Make Grand Hamburgers, and Success is the Idea of the Enemy of the Good of the Great, or whatever. And another feature that these books all have is that they have little testimonials, like, you know, Jennifer is a mid-level executive and she's been having these problems. And this book sort of has those, only what they are are parables, where we take um, different Hans Christian Andersen stories and we tell them from different points of view. And on the CD, of course, these are all read by Margaret. And so now Margaret is going to read us um, a different version of a parable of the princess and the pea. <coughs> The Parable of the Princess and the Pea There once was a prince who longed to have a princess by his side, but not all the time. More precisely, there once was a prince who longed to have a princess who was continually in need of rescuing, occasionally, at his side. For times had changed in the land, you see, and merely going out and slaying creatures just because they were different or smelly or had dietary requirements at variance from the norm was no longer acceptable. It was still widely acknowledged, however, if the aforesaid different smelly or nutritionally divergent creature was to abscond with a princess who was somehow associated with a prince, well then, the era of officially sanctioned tolerance and we are all brothers under the skin or scales or fur or shell or feathers or gelatinous goo was out and the age of gleeful mayhem and slaughter was back in. Accompanied by his noble steed, noble, the prince imagined he would rescue his princess from the fiercest of dragons, the ugliest of orcs, the hugest of giants. For her, he would even brave the beasts so repulsive they had no name, or names so repulsive that even the beast preferred itself not to be called. For his princess, he would climb, mostly on top of his noble steed Noble, the heights of Mount Flabadoon to vanquish the many-feathered Flassie. For her, he would descend again about as far as the noble steed noble could descend, the deepest depths to subjugate the many-tongued brocacy, the treacherous sand gazabons of the driest desert and the dastardly histobes of the deepest jungle would feel his vengeance as he rescued his beloved princess. Okay, so you get the idea. The prince, being a dutiful son, went to his mother and declared to her in strong and clear tones, Mother, I, a prince who wishes to do heroic things in this bureaucratic age, desires a princess to be at my side, except when she is carried away and hence requires heroic rescuing. Oh, my son, said the queen, long have I dreamt of this day. <laughs> Now, my son, any heroic deeds must be done properly, which means that any princess you rescue and then kiss, you must first wed. The prince considered the wise words of his mother, the queen. Mother, I, a prince who wishes to do heroic things in this increasingly bureaucratic and rule-bound age, desires a princess to be at my side, except when she is carried away and hence requires heroic rescuing. The queen replied, only the most princessly of princesses deserves my hand of you, my son. I shall determine whom shall be your bride, for as a queen, I am best qualified what should be in the heart of a princess who deserves to be your bride. So go outside and play and prepare for your wedding and the heroic rescues that will ensue. Now, as word spread far and wide that the prince desired a bride, a veritable castle of princesses soon descended upon the castle. It soon became apparent that mere lineage and dress was not enough to pass the muster of Her Majesty, the Queen. Some princesses laughed too loud and were too boisterous. Others laughed not at all and were too grim. Some princesses fell asleep during affairs of state. Others paid too much attention and tried to express an opinion. <laughs> Some princesses enjoyed the opera and tried to sing along. Others hated the opera so much they tried to strangle the plump tenors. And thus the line of princesses leaving the castle was exactly the same length as the line of those entering. Despair raged in the heart and other parts of the prince who longed to do great deeds. But one night a terrible storm was raging and there was a knock at the castle door. The door was opened and there was a sopping wet damsel bedraggled who demanded entrance and then a bed for the night. Sensing something innately princessy about her, 
The queen had assembled a pile of 20 mattresses and beds, which if you think about it is a pretty rare feat of impressive domestic engineering in and of itself, considering it was done late at night and on the fly. Now, unnoticed by the damsel and after much consideration, the queen slipped a 35 sun-dried petite majestic number two key under the bottom of the heap of mattresses and beds. The damsel was then hoisted, some say flung, onto the top of the pile and bid good night. In the morning, there were one in 20 grumpy people in the castle, the 20 who had been deprived of their mattresses and beds in the middle of the night, and the damsel who had slept on them. The damsel was asked by the queen, did you sleep well? The other 20, needless to say, were never queried by the queen. Oh, said the damsel, no, I scarcely slept at all. Heaven knows what's in that bed. I lay on something so hard that I'm black and blue all over. It was simply lumpy. At once, the queen recognized a kindred spirit and declared the damsel was indeed a true princess and thus worthy of her son's hand in marriage. So great was the need for the prince to engage in daring do that the wedding was conducted almost at once. And soon thereafter, the castle was to hear a constant refrain from the newly married princess. This porridge is too lumpy. This dress feels too lumpy. This path is too lumpy, and that sky is too lumpy. And while the prince still longed to have his princess carried away by some hideous creature, <laughs> any creature really, <laughs> he was less sure he would bother to go and rescue her. He planned to sort of play it by ear. The moral of this story is, if you're going to give someone a test, make sure you can live with the results. <laughs>